to present uh, my colleague Ivan Moody, uh, who is composer, conductor, and musicologist at CESM. My name is Jelena Novak. I'm also a researcher at CESM, at Group for Theory, Critica e Comunicação, uh, like Ivan. Um, Ivan's biography is really interesting because I think it's not very often that one person uh, goes in so many different directions. So he's a very fruitful composer. Um, he uh, composes music that is very often inspired by Eastern liturgical chant. And he himself also is a, even, please correct me if I don't pronounce it well, but proto prosbeter at uh, Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople. Um, so he studied composition uh, in, at the University of London and also at the University of York and privately with John Taverner. Uh, these influences are palpable in, in his opus. And uh, he composed many compositions uh, for choir and, and different ensembles. Uh, he's also a conductor. Uh, he conducted many ensembles in UK, Spain, USA, Finland, uh, Serbia, Montenegro. Uh, but today, even uh, when we prepared a little bit this talk yesterday, he said that he would like to talk most uh, about his academical path and to present more his work uh, at CESM and uh, his research. Uh, because he thinks that quite often his research is in a kind of shadow of uh, his compositional career and his career as a conductor. Um, so I think I give a word to Ivan and we continue to discuss both in Portuguese and in English and through a dialogue. Yes, Ivan, please. Uh, thank you very much. Valalepo, Yelena. Um, uh, uh, English, but um, uh, if you wish to ask questions, please do ask them in Portuguese. Um, uh, that, that's that's no problem. Um, secondly, I would like to thank Rita Torres for organising these sessions, and it's a pleasure to to be here. Um, as Yelena said. Um, uh, uh, I have the feeling that most people know my work as a composer better than they do as a musicologist. Not really a complaint on my part, um, uh, because it partly has to do with the kinds of things I've been working on musicologically, which um, perhaps don't have much resonance in Portugal. But I will come back to that because that's something I think can uh, change. So, um, so first of all, as, as a composer, I have indeed written a great deal of choral music. Um, and uh, as Yelena said, I'm, I'm a priest in the Orthodox Church. Um, so I have a natural interest in liturgical music and liturgical texts. And so those kinds of inspirations are very much present in both my choral music and my um, instrumental music. And I'm in no sense just a choral composer. I've written a great deal of music for uh, all sorts of um, um, uh, um, combinations of, in, of instruments, many concertos, uh, a chamber opera, uh, um, lots of chamber music, um, many solo pieces. And I um, intend to continue to, to, to do that. Um, uh, but uh, the question of these influences, the, these, my interest in um, liturgical chant and when I speak of liturgical chant in this context, I'm talking about Byzantine chant, so the traditional music of uh, the Greek-speaking Christian world, um, and, and other traditions that are parallel to it, or slightly later, or quite a lot later. So there are various traditions of Russian chant. There are Byzantine influences working in uh, countries like Bulgaria and Romania. And Serbia has its own tradition of chant, and I will come back to that. All these things interest me. 
Um, they are multilingual because Byzantine chant, the original language for it is, is Greek, but it's been adapted to other languages, Slavonic, um, Arabic, Romanian, um, and, and increasingly now uh, English, in fact, especially in the United States, there are um, a number of outstanding um, composers who, who adapt Byzantine chant to the English language, having understood the way it works formulaically. So this is exactly like um, Gregorian chant. Once you understand the way the formulas work, you can, you can compose using those formulas. Um, and if you're really good, you can step outside them and use them in a very inventive and uh, creative fashion. So um, um, when I talk about these systems of, of chant, uh, I don't just mean monophonic chant. Byzantine chant is, is um, uh, traditionally monophonic. It's one voice, sometimes with a, 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 an ison. Ison means a drone, a bourdon. Uh, so you have an accompanying held note and, and the melody above it. Um, and and uh, the oldest repertoires, with the exception of Orthodox chant from Georgia, which is uh, three voiced, uh, all of it, the other, the other traditions are monophonic, they're for one voice. And um, when you come to um, uh, more recent centuries, there's the question of whether you should harmonize this chant or not, or whether it should continue to be um, very traditional and sung only by um, not one voice necessarily. There, there are Byzantine choirs, but it's one melodic line. And that's generated a great deal of polemic. And that has a great deal to do with the kind of research I have um, been undertaking. So, um, in parallel with that, I've uh, always been interested in um, contemporary music from Eastern countries. Um, I've written a great deal about composers like Schnitke, um, Cancelli, uh, Arvo Pärt, and composers who are less known from Greece, for example, um, Michalis Azamis, uh, the ninth anniversary of whose death actually falls today, uh, Dimitri Tetsakis. Um, there are many interesting composers working in these countries. Um, and they are not hugely well known outside their own countries. Um, some years ago, uh, 15 years ago, I suppose, I began to um, uh, have the opportunity to travel in Balkan countries and specifically, um, apart from Greece, which I had already worked in, um, but specifically Bulgaria and, and then Serbia. So I came to be aware of the uh, liturgical traditions in those countries and the music that was used in church and the fact that there was simultaneously a monophonic tradition, one voice music and single voice music and um, polyphonic. Now in the Orthodox world, the word polyphonic is not much liked because it suggests elaborate counterpoint. Um, so <laughs> people will get around this by saying multi-part, uh, as the ethnomusicologists tend to, to say. Um, but the reality is that it is, it is um, polyphonic, polyphonic in the sense of being many voices and not just one voice. Um, so I became much more familiar with this repertoire. And over the many times I traveled, particularly to, to Serbia, um, I collected a massive library of scores and uh, actually, I should say at this point, not just of liturgical music, I'm not just interested in liturgical music. There's a flourishing um, uh, contemporary music scene in Greece, as there is in Serbia. Um, there are many difficulties to overcome, but the composers are of, of an extremely high order. What they write is um, uh, really fascinating. And, um, and, and then I, I began to make links between these things and um, the historical trajectory of these countries. So if we think in other words of um, countries that had been occupied by the Ottoman Empire, uh, which includes of course uh, the Balkans as a whole, um, you have this um, uh, confrontation between 
the uh, remains of the Byzantine Empire, the remains of Byzantine culture, um, filtered through centuries of Ottoman domination. Um, and when the Ottoman Empire comes to an end, when these nation states become nation states, and I mean Greece, Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, um, they, they uh, suddenly have a freedom um, in, in many senses, and they send their finest artists uh, abroad. They go to, depends where you are, but uh, in the, the, the Greeks very often went to, of course, the, 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 the Greeks didn't have the communist problem afterwards, but they had different problems. But in this period in between, they would send their uh, composers went to study, for example, in, in Paris. There was a very strong French connection, as there was in Romania. There's, there's a, a real connection between France and Romania. Um, in Serbia, it was more likely to be Germany or Austria. So composers would go and study in Leipzig or, or Vienna. Um, and and the, the, but there were mixtures. In other words, these countries who who, who had just become countries felt themselves to be. Um, and and again, I will bring this back. Like many Mediterranean cultures, um, on on a periphery, and they wanted to send their composers, their artists, to the center to go and learn techniques. And many of them did. And if they were good, they brought these techniques back and uh, began to teach. Uh, in their own countries and to create in their own countries and to process what they had learned abroad in combination with their own traditions. In Serbia, the first one to do this really was Stevan Mokranjat, who is a kind of Bach or Palestrina of, of Serbia. Um, he, he's the beginning of the art tradition in, in, in that uh, sense. Um, yeah, he was a choral composer, but uh, of both sacred and secular music. And he, one of the important things he did was to codify the sacred music yeah, because the, in Serbia, the notation got lost because they couldn't have printing presses. Um, uh, they had to rely on oral tradition. So the chant developed as an oral tradition and Mokranjic and other people, Cornelius Stankovic, um, Tihu Mejostovic, a number of other, uh, what they call melographers. So mush melographers, the people who write the melodies down went around the country, writing down the melodies that the chanters in the churches sang. And Mokranjac, well, Stankovic did it first, but then Mokranjac was more comprehensive. Um, he published um, a monophonic uh, series of volumes for the church year, for all the feasts and for all the normal days. And then he did it again in harmonized versions. Now, this is something that didn't happen in countries like Greece. Um, so the conflict came later on in the 20th century when, and this is a general thing in the Balkans, when you have these traditions, Byzantinism and Ottomanism, to coin a phrase, come into conflict with modernism. And uh, the later you go, the more virulent the modernism is. So in Bulgaria, you had, for example, there was a, a famous modernist theorist called Chavdar Mutatov. Um, uh, I'm sorry, who, who um, was very influenced by Russian proto-communist ideas. Um, and there was a, a Mitsich in Serbia, very much the same thing. They brought these ideas back. And um, there, there were attempts to reconcile uh, these kinds of modernism with the traditions that they'd inherited. In the case of Serbia and Romania, you can see it very strongly in the architecture. There are modern buildings, and you can see they are modern, but they have a very strong Byzantine influence. The, um, in, uh, the, there was a telephone exchange built in, <laughs> in uh, uh, Belgrade in Serbia, for example, which is Byzantine in inspiration. Now, if we think about this in the West, the idea of having, um, possibly with the exception of bull rings, actually, I hadn't thought about this, but um, the idea of having a modern building for a modern function um, inspired in, in, in that kind of tradition is, is a very unusual one. Um, but this is what happened. And um, there's a parallel in, in, in music. Um, whereas in Russia, uh, after the revolution of 1917, the composition of sacred music essentially stopped. Uh, and in Bulgaria, it was, it, it was very difficult as well. It didn't entirely stop, but it was extremely complicated. 
Indeed. In Serbia, it, it still continued. So you have a, a, a really um, impressive production of sacred music right up to the Second World War that has no parallel in, in Russia. Um, and, and some of these composers, um, uh, such as Milivoy Tsurchanin and um, uh, uh, Zhivkovich, I've forgotten his first name, um, they wrote church music that tried to reconcile modernism and Byzantinism. And when I say modernism, it's still a kind of um, late romantic style. You, you see a lot of influence of Bruckner or Strauss, um, composers like that. Um, uh, but they're trying to reconcile this with the use of chant melodies. And so you have this fascinating hybrid music. In their concert music, not all of these composers did write concert music, but one who did was in Serbia was, was um, uh, Stevan Hristic, um, uh, who was a, 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 an opera composer, ballet composer, and he wrote uh, um, uh, some, some, uh, some of the standard works in the repertoire, what are now standard works in the repertoire uh, in those forms, but he also wrote church music. And again, you can see this kind of um, attempt to reconcile um, two different um, modes of being. In, in concert music, this has been called moderated modernism, which is a concept um, that it, it came from Adorno originally, and was then developed by um, Hermann Danose in an article, and has since been applied to Serbian music particularly by uh, a colleague of Yelena's and of mine, uh, Ivana Medic, who's written specifically about the application of the idea of moderated not moderate, but moderated modernism uh, to, to um, art music in, in, in Serbia. Um, and it's moderated, uh, so it, it, it's, um, this is difficult to convey in Portuguese, in <laughs> but it, it's, it's moderated by human agency. Um, in other words, it's intentional. Um, and, and so you have a, a, a whole corpus of music that is um, attempting to engage with modernism, attempting, attempting to be part of the new wave of, um, of, of um, influences that come from the West, but at the same time has a respect for, uh, uh, in this case, Serbian tradition, but the same is applicable in other, in other areas. Uh, there's the famous case of Konstantin Ilyev in, in Bulgaria, who uh, managed to do this, do a similar thing with, with Bulgarian folk music, but he only managed to do that because he left Sofia, he left the capital, and was able to work in the provinces. And he wrote some really um, remarkably avant-garde music, and when he brought it back to Sofia, the composers' union all stood up and, and left. But he was called back to the stage for seven encores. It's a famous piece of his called Fragmenti, uh, which illustrates this very well. But the, the musical material he was using was very much based on Bulgarian uh, folk music. So there's this um, continuation of, of, of tradition uh, in spite of seeking to be, to be uh, modern. Um, how does this relate to Mediterranean culture? This is a question um, I asked myself during a number of years, because whenever I go to um, the Balkans, I, <laughs> especially Serbia and Greece, I feel as though I am in the south of Europe, which is true. And um, there has been some speculation on the part of Serbian uh, historians as to whether Serbia is in fact a Mediterranean culture. Now, one of the definitions of Mediterranean culture is where the olive tree grows, um, which can't actually be true because we do have olive trees growing in Chile, for example, but of course they were imported. So where the olive tree naturally grows, you have the Mediterranean basin, including Greece, including Croatia, but not really including Serbia. Um, uh, so how, how, how do you reconcile these things? My idea was that there was a greater Mediterranean culture, and and having lived as long as I have in in Mediterranean culture, Portugal is of course an Atlantic culture, but it's still a Mediterranean one. 
and and having traveled uh, extensively through Spain and Italy, um, I, I thought there must be a connection. So so the project I'm working on uh, at the moment, and it's a it's a slow project, um, but it, it's it's something that um, uh, yields results um, if you if you work at it. Um, my idea was if you draw a line that begins in Portugal, and it has to begin in Portugal because it's the end of Europe, um, and you, 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 you take that line through Spain and you take it al along the Mediterranean basin. So you go through Italy, you go through Croatia. Croatia is crucially important because, um, well, I'll, I'll come back to it, but Croatia, and then you, you go into um, uh, Greece and, and, and Serbia and Bulgaria, and you, you have this kind of jagged line, this, this uh, wobbly line that nevertheless, nevertheless connects things, connects phenomena in these culture, which I was feeling and not understanding why they were connecting. So when I saw that Serbian authors were openly speculating on whether Serbian culture uh, was in fact, or could be, conceived of as a Mediterranean culture. This made me very interested. I'm going to come back to Croatia because um, one of the obvious dichotomies um, is the Orthodox East and the Catholic uh, West. Um, uh, so so the, the, there's a, a Croatia, of course, is, is not an Orthodox country, um, but it's right in the middle there of, of the Balkans. It connects the Orthodox side and the Catholic side. It's as much Italian as it is Yugoslavian. And Yugoslavia is another very complicated and fascinating question in, in all this as well. Um, so, so Croatia is a kind of fulcral point in this kind of uh, research. Um, uh, uh, the, other, the other point about the Mediterranean countries is they also, became actual countries while this phenomenon was going on as well in the Balkans. So you've got the unification of Italy and the monarchic Republican wars uh, in Spain and in, in Portugal. And, and, and things become stabilized um, at more or less the same time. So you've, you've got a kind of solidification of Southern Europe, if you like, um, over the course of, well, I suppose a hundred years, if you, if you take it to the limits but it's all happening from the from the middle of the 19th century right up into the into the early 20th century and this inevitably has an influence on um, what artists are doing so the the idea that uh, is very uh, frequently expressed in countries like Portugal and Spain that they are on the edge of Europe they are peripheral and you need to go to the center as, as I've already said this idea was of course very much present in um, in countries like uh, 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 Greece and, and Serbia, and they thought they were missing out on something. My contention is that, in fact, by going west, the artists, the composers who, who, who went west, learned something and came back to their native countries, actually brought back a, a great richness, especially uh, because they tended to be the most technically competent. Uh, a, a composer like Mokranjac was, was his, his technique is extraordinary, um, for example. And, and there were uh, Greek composers, Emilius Riadis, beginning of the 20th century. He has a string quartet, which you could believe was by Ravel, for example. Um, there's a technical fluency there that enabled them precisely to take what they wanted from their Western training and bring it back. And um, I was going to say infuse, but that's the, that's the, the, the wrong word. It's more like crossbreed with their native um, uh, traditions. And actually Riadis is an interesting case because he did write liturgical music as well, um, but he didn't use chant. He, he, he wrote um, a number of pieces which are very, very idiosyncratic. They're never used today liturgically. There are in fact a, a couple of modern recordings of his work, but you wouldn't go into a church and hear this uh, music being sung. Um, um, so you have um, something that's completely different from the 
what we like to think of as the linear trajectory of Western Europe. Um, uh, of, of course, we feel at a distance the influences of Germany, the influences of Italy, the influences of France. But there's this fascinating dialogue that happens all the time between those influences and the uh, necessity um, felt in varying degrees by composers when they come back to their native countries, when they go back to Greece or to Serbia or to Bulgaria, and also when they go back to Spain or to Portugal or to Italy to engage with the past. Meli Piero, for example, in Italy was obsessed with, with um, Italy as uh, the inheritor of classical Rome. And this was what he informed his, his um, his approach to, to, to music. So all these things mattered to him. The past mattered to him enormously. And he wasn't going to throw that away because he'd got a modern training. Um, similarly with um, De Falla in Spain, um, uh, we can hear all these uh, modernist influences on him as Stravinsky is very much present, but so is Cantejondo, so uh, the whole flamenco tradition, and so is uh, Catholic theology, um, uh, uh, his, his interest in Catholic uh, philosophers such as Jacques Maritain, who is also of fascination to Stravinsky. All these things make a mixture that could not have happened in precisely that way with, for example, a, a German composer, much less a British composer, or, 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 um, or a French composer might have got part of the way there, but it would have been exoticism. Now, th in the case of the Falia, um, uh, th that tradition was there. It was, it was part of his vocabulary. It was what he used, it was what he, he worked with. And you can say the same, um, and, and in a very extraordinary way, about uh, Freitas Branco in, 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 in Portugal, because he was so omnivorous and so technically competent that he could do anything. He was a chameleon, he could assume any guise. And I can't think of anyone quite like him, in fact. Freitas Branco is a really remarkable. Um, composer by any standards uh, in, in, in this context. But the point was, and, and he was a cosmopolitan. He was multilingual, he traveled, and he uh, absorbed all these things, but he never lost his, um, and, and he wasn't a folklorist um, in, 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 the, in the sense of arranging folk songs. He did do that, but not, uh, not in a way some other composers did. Um, and, and so, his, his uh, method of um, harnessing um, uh, Portuguese mythology, so to speak, such as Vatek, but using the most modern techniques is, is really something uh, extraordinary. And, and so therefore, when all these composers, um, let's say active up to the Second World War, because it was the larger part of whose production is, is, is apparent um, is manifest up to the beginning of the Second World War. Um, that establishes the basis for future generations. Um, and so you have things, uh, so, um, the creation of the symphony in, in Portugal. If we trace it from, uh, uh, well, there is of course the earlier tradition of, of, of um, Bon Tempo and so on. But if we, if we trace, trace the modern symphony, so back to Viana da Mota, and then we have Freitas Branco, and then Jolie Berger Santos, and and a number of other things. But it's it's a, it's um it's a reinvented in the sense of rediscovered tradition, reinvigorated. Um, and and, and various questions that uh, occur in parallel with this in Spain, particularly, for example, they felt the need of a national opera. That was the burning question for so long. Let's have a national opera. And in fact, in Portugal, that wasn't really such a problem um, uh, because you already had the tradition of, of Italian opera. So when you have Alfredo Kyle write, writing a Serrana uh, and there's a Portuguese text, um, it seems this is a kind of logical conclusion. In fact, I wrote a paper um, some years ago, making a direct comparison between Serrana and Nauranku by Stanislav Binicki, Serbian composer. This is considered the first Serbian opera, first Serbian national opera. And 
there are many parallels. They're, they're contemporary. This is extraordinary. And, and uh, there are many parallels. But um, uh, uh, Binichki finds his exoticism in the opera in, in the Ottoman. So the, the other in the opera is the Ottoman. There is, there is a Muezzin and so on. And there's this... Uh, um, orientalizing element whereas in the case of uh, Alfred Bukail it's of course the the Serana is the mountain girl so it's an interior uh, orient it, it's it's um a discovery of the other within uh, Portugal but the parallels are, are, are extremely interesting um I think I've run out of things to say but um um, these are the things that interest me. Uh, I will show you two things. One, one, is, one is this book, which is from 2014. So this is uh, um, Modernism and Orthodox Spirituality in Contemporary Music. And uh, it has chapters on, um, it has an introduction, then a chapter on Greece, a chapter on Bulgaria, a chapter on Serbia, a chapter on Russia and beyond chapter on Finland and Rautavara, then a chapter on Arvo Pert and a chapter on John Tavener. Um, and the, 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 the opening chapters uh, to do with these different Orthodox countries, countries of Orthodox tradition, and the way they reacted to modernism is precisely what led me to develop these themes in um, other articles and in conferences and so on. And it's amazing how wide you can spread this. This is another book of which I'm one of the editors Ivan Amedic was the other. So this came out of a conference. Um, this is published in, in Belgrade. Um, Orthodox music, politics and art in Russia and Eastern Europe. And um, the, the, the conference brought together people from all sorts of countries in, in London, in fact. Um, uh, uh, and the, the book that resulted is, is a remarkable confluence of, of ideas and approaches in which you see the parallels um, and people don't know for example people don't know what went on in Lithuania or what went on in Latvia um, at this time um, and we had people from those countries present in this conference and, and who um, the, the chapters appear in, in this book um, and so um, the other thing to say is that since the fall of communism, archives in what we used to call Eastern Europe, um, Russia particularly, but not only, they, they've become much more available to, to researchers. So you can have access to scores and to documents that were very difficult uh, of access before. Um, I have to say that in Serbia, um, people have always been extremely uh, generous, very willing to share things and to, um, very often, I remember having to pay 100 euros in excess luggage weight because I had a suitcase full of photocopies of scores and, and documents that people had given me. Um, but it was it was worth 100 euros. Um, and the, the other problem in this kind of research is a linguistic one because people don't tend to speak Latin language, Latin languages and Slavic ones, or very few people. And if you're in a particular area of research, um, it means you have a specialized vocabulary. And, and so it's, it's actually quite difficult to get um, a, a bird's eye view of, of these, these kinds of uh, problems. Nevertheless, that is the challenge I have set myself and that is what I've been working on. So I hope I've said enough, uh, Yelena. Yes, uh, do you speak the, the, these all languages? Because I know that you speak some Serbian. Do you speak? Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I, I speak um, Latin languages very well. Uh, 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 the, the Slavic languages, I learned Russian many years ago and then I forgot it because I never used it, but I can read it. And um, uh, so I speak Serbian reasonably well and I can get by in, in Bulgarian and, and my Greek is okay as well. Um, none of them are, are completely fluent, but the point is to be able to read them. If you can read them, um, then you can, you can research in them. And may I ask you, because I think we never talked about that, um, because when I step back and, and I look your career as composer, as academic, as conductor, 
the line that connects it all, it's orthodox spirituality. But yeah. I don't remember that we talked about how you became interested in it in, in the first place. Ah, <laughs> well, that's a long story. Um, I became orthodox when I was 22 or 23 years old in, in London, in the Russian church. Um, but that, I mean, that's a, was a, a, my own spiritual trajectory, which I, I don't think has a, a place here particularly. But since then, well, uh, one thing I would say is the fact that I wasn't born in an orthodox country means that I've always felt this openness to all these traditions. Um, it doesn't matter to me if it's Greek or Bulgarian or Serbian or Russian. They all seem to me to be things I have access to and can work with. So that, that's been a very important consideration. Yeah. And I also know that uh, you act as a conductor and uh, as a priest in a church in Estoril, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, we have we have a, a parish here in, in Estoril where I'm, I'm the, the priest. Um, and it's a it's a multi. This is typical as well. It's a multilingual, <laughs> cosmopolitan parish. We have we have Greeks, Russians, Serbs, uh, Italians, uh, Americans, French people, all, all sorts of people. So um, it's it's um, it, it's a kind of reflection of of, of my um, approach as well. Okay. Yeah, I invite someone of the colleagues if they're. Uh willing to pose some question or to comment upon something. Uh, Philippa, Isabel, Luisa, uh, Rita, uh, Nicholas was there, but I don't see him anymore. Uh, yeah, you mentioned this uh, moderate modernism that is a floscula. Uh, uh, moder moderated, moderated. Moderate modernism. Um, I like it very much and I think it's a very useful term. Uh, in many senses, to conceptualize this uh, tendency of, in a way, also imitating what was happening in a in a kind of big world, uh, because uh, in in Serbia, but not only Serbia, but uh, more or less other Yugoslav republics, also there was this tendency of being late to catch up with modernity. And I even heard a few times uh, Floscula uh, moderated postmodernism, which, yes. <laughs> which is also interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, but this is this is what um, the, the Balkan countries have in common with with with, with the Mediterranean countries. There, there's always this feeling of we are late to catch up, and 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 it's very interesting actually that, that some countries. What's happened in Portugal is very interesting because things for a while were very um, um, uh, solid. The, the, there was only one aesthetic direction you could have as a composer. And then things changed, especially with the, with the amazing teaching, compositional teaching that, that happened with um, uh, Christopher Bochman and Tony Pino Vargas. Um, they, they caused a real revolution in teaching because they were open to different approaches. Very rigorous in what they did, but the younger composers learned so much that they would never have learned in another way. And, you know, um, and also uh, the, the, the Gulbenkian um, um, Contemporary Music Festival, it suddenly opened up. There were two years when Ivan Monigetti was the uh, artistic director. And he had pieces by Arvo Pert and Cancelli, which would never have been performed at the Gulbenkian before. So there was a kind of tipping point and um, an, an opening up to other aesthetics. Now that has not happened in the same way in Spain. Spain is stuck in Jurassic Park, you know? It's, um, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's really very odd. So uh, uh, I, I see more comparisons in that sense with Portugal and a country like Serbia or Greece than I do with Spain, um, uh, because the, the, there's, there's, there's a political element to all this as well, of course. I mean, cultural politics. So it, it's fascinating to see how this works. Philippa, I think Philippa wanted to ask something, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, uh, turn on your... Uh, of course, of course. No, 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 I didn't want to say anything. Uh, 
but uh, I, I would like to compliment uh, the work of Ivan. But uh, uh, can you just repeat, do you have any connection with this uh, or the contemporary music um, uh, encounters at Gulbenkian with these composers, these connections? Could you explore a bit more about this? Ivan? Um, uh, well, I, I was only speaking about my experience as somebody who went to the concerts. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was very interesting, actually. Um, during one of those years, um, Ivan Monigetti commissioned a piece from Cancelli called mm -hmm. Di Piplito, which had a solo countertenor. Um, and um, it was, it's a beautiful piece. And I was sitting next to Tomas Marco, this oh. uh, Spanish composer. Mm -hmm. and, and he, 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 he said, um, uh, esta obra no tiene sustancia, no tiene contenido. Really? <laughs> ¿Dónde está la música? Yes. <laughs> and and I, I thought that he'd fundamentally misunderstood what the piece was about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, have great, I have great respect for Tomás Marco, don't get me wrong, but I just thought this is a kind of, you know, these, these two points of view are never going to meet. Yeah. So that, that was very interesting. But my, I was really talking about my experience as, as a listener, as, as somebody who used to go to these concerts sure. and just my impression of the way things worked. I have absolutely no connection really with the Gorbenkian at all um, in, in, in those matters. So um, it's just my, my own impressions. Yeah. Thank you. And even uh, uh, are you inspired as a composer? How does it go from your academic activity to your composition? Uh, you become become inspired by what you discover in your research, and then you use it as an inspiration in, in composition, or the other way around. Or uh, that's a very good question. It it tends to be more the other way around. I usually say that if I were not a composer, I would not be a musicologist because for me, composing is the most important thing. But the fact that I am a composer informs the way I look at music as a musicologist. So I, I, I tend to think of music as a composer. And so when I'm looking at somebody's work, I think, why has this composer chosen this way to do things? Uh, what 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 is behind that decision? And and it's not um, not analysis in the conventional sense. It's more an, an instinctive kind of thing, um, uh, and and aesthetic. Um, uh, well, of course, there is analysis in that, of course, but I, it's it's not that kind of um, technical analysis. I, I I've not really done that. Um, but to turn the question around, um, uh, yes, I mean, sometimes I come across something, um, something that a composer has done, and I think, how interesting. And I investigate what's happened, why the composer has done this, uh, and how. And sometimes that will lead to not, a, not an imitation, but a kind of refraction, a kind of... Um, um, continuation of the idea, but on my own terms, um, it's very difficult to explain what how that might work. But um, well, one of the things that interested me, which I mentioned earlier on, was this piece by Konstantin Yuliev, Fragmenti. When you look at the score of this piece, and you see he, the way he uses the cells, the melodic cells of Bulgarian folk music, and you think, well, how did he, how did he use that and come up with this sound? which uh, completely destroyed, destroyed his credibility with the traditionalists, but he's still using traditional music. So uh, these, these kinds of larger aesthetic questions do, do interest me very much. And, and I suppose by thinking about them, you know, they're, they're all at the back of my head, they're always there. And, and so in, in, in that sense, there, 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 is, there is an influence. I, I do feel that musicology is complementary to, to composition. And I'm thinking often about the role of the, the human voice and the fact that uh, most of this music is sang by various voices together, which is also interesting. Uh, how do you look, at, both as musicologist and, and as a composer, uh, 
to these questions of singing, of why it's necessary to sing, what changes when we sing something in comparison when we hear the same thing being spoken and how does that, uh, uh, I don't know, influence you or provokes you in, in, uh, in music and in research, the human voice singing? Mm. Um, you know, I, I am by instinct a vocal composer. So even my instrumental music tends to be vocal in, in conception. So, so there are sung lines. I remember, I'll give you an example. I, I wrote a, a concerto for the tuba for um, Sergio Carolino. And it was uh, performed at uh, Ejmel in, in Lisbon. And it, it was a student, an excellent student ensemble. And uh, some of them came up to me and said, this is a really difficult piece to play because we have melodies. Normally we're just used to doing boom, boom, boom. <laughs> you actually write melodies and they weren't used to this so that, that was an interesting thing um, I mean they accepted the challenge and, and enjoyed it but but um, I mean fundamentally my music is, is, is melodic so there's always the idea of intonation I suppose and of course if you intone something it can be vocalese it can be without text um, but when, if a piece is inspired by a text and you want to have the text there, of course, you enter into a different world because in some way you connect uh, the music with the text. However you choose to do that, there are many ways of doing it. Um, so there's, to use a very unpopular word, there's an expressivity there because you've got the text, which would not be there if you just thought of the text and, and wrote a piece about it. So if the text is actually present, um, it means there's a, 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 a direct connection. Of course, in the case of liturgical music, that's very obvious because you're singing music for a particular moment in, in the liturgy. Um, if you are, um, and, and actually that's one of the things that makes all this um, what I call paraliturgical music, very interesting. So you have music that uses liturgical texts, but is actually for concert use. And so you, you, you bring one world into the other, you bring the world of the church into the concert hall. And that, that's very interesting and productive in, in another way as well. But of course, then you can also have um, um, uh, music that, that deliberately mixes these things, music that, that is, is aimed at the concert hall and might quote from a liturgical tradition or might quote folk music. It doesn't have to be sacred. It could be folk music or, or uh, even a quotation from some other composer, you know, something like that. So that's going to depend on the resonance it has for you as a composer. Um, and that, that, that's different in, in, each, in each case, I think. Um, but certainly the idea of melody, um, that, that, that's fundamental to me. I have a question. I'm going to do it in Portuguese. Tudo uh, bem. Já, a propósito das influências, já encontraste influências da tua investigação na música de outros compositores? Ah, <laughs> sim. Um, em alguns jovens que eu já dei vários cursos e, e um, seminários e coisas assim, um, em que encontro jovens compositores que me dizem eh, estive a ler o seu artigo sobre não sei quem, ou, ouvi a sua peça e depois fui investigar e descobri isto e aquilo. Portanto, há, há uma cadeia de influências um, da qual não, não tenho conhecimento naquele momento. Só, só sei depois, não é? Um, isso é muito interessante. Uh, e, e muito curioso. E depois há, há duas, três, quatro teses de doutoramento sobre a minha obra. E eu acho fascinante ler o que outras pessoas dizem nessas circunstâncias sobre a minha música, a, a maneira em que eles veem o que eu faço. Porque pode não necessariamente corresponder à minha maneira de, maneira de ver o que eu faço. E isso é, é, é enriquecedor também. <risos> é, é, é muito curioso. 
E eu acho que é importante estar atento a essas coisas, estar atento a a percepção das outras pessoas do, 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 do que nós, nós fazemos, não é? É muito interessante. Mas e já, e já escreveste sobre a forma como tu o fazes? Ou seja, já fizeste análise do teu, dos teus processos? Até um, a até um certo ponto, sim. Já fiz... Um, aliás, é uma coisa que eu vou ter de fazer agora, porque uh, vai haver uma obra minha uh, posta... Uh, no site de portfólios da, da, da Esmo, enfim, é dentro de meses, e tenho de escrever um texto analítico sobre a obra. E, e isso é sempre interessante, porque eu, eu não penso imediatamente como é que eu fiz uma obra. Isso, essa obra já tem 10 anos, portanto, vou, vou ter de voltar à obra e fazer uma análise <risos> e, e pensar como é que eu fiz isto, por que é que eu optei por fazer assim e etc, etc, isso, isso é muito interessante e, e já agora uh, quando estou a dirigir uma obra minha uh, tenho de fazer uma, uma, uma espécie de análise como um mestre que não corresponde à minha, à minha ideia da peça necessariamente eu tenho de olhar aquilo muito objetivamente não é? e pensar como é que eu faço, mas por que é que não podem respirar aqui, o que é que, onde é que acaba a frase, essas coisas todas. Outra vez, se é uma obra com 10 anos ou coisa assim, mais difícil é, ou seja, não é difícil, é mais objetivo, porque é como qualquer outra peça, se eu estou a dizer uma peça de outra pessoa, hum, pego na partitura e pronto, tomo decisões, e tenho de fazer a mesma coisa com a minha própria música. <risos> e essa objetividade é, é muito interessante. Não sei se respondi à pergunta, mas... Obrigada. Desculpem, surgiu uma curiosidade minha. Em inglês uhum. ou português? É igual? É indiferente? Okay. Como quiseres. Uh, por acaso, a, a, a pensar em alguma incorporação uh, nas tuas obras de outros elementos de outro, artísticos, um bocadinho no contexto do teatro e música, não é? Alguma vez tiveste interesse em experimentar essas práticas, por exemplo? Um, sim, mas uh, até agora não tive oportunidade. Ok. <risos> Muito <simplesmente. risos> um, eu, eu mencionei. Podia também não ter interesse. Podias não ter interesse, claro. Não, não é falta de interesse. É, é, essas coisas têm de surgir naturalmente, não é? Há, há bocado é. eu falei numa ópera de câmara que eu fiz e era um, a intenção original era que fosse para, para um, marionetas. Uhum. Mas isso não, não resultou por ad, razões administrativas, não, 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 por, não foi por falta de um, prática. Pois, não, não, exatamente. Um, mas não, não deu e a estreia foi feita com, com, com pronto, pessoas normais, não é? Uh, e resultou muito bem, mas não foi exatamente o que eu tinha imaginado. E gostava de voltar àquilo e fazer com marionetas, de facto. Mas pronto, é um exemplo muito óbvio, se calhar. Mas, não, mas é, é, também é uma questão de tempo, sabes? É uma questão de, de, de estar com disponibilidade para colaborar com outro artista. Às vezes, não é? Para, para, o que é que este artista plástico uh, pode... Um, como é que nós podemos cruzar como é que uh, podemos criar alguma coisa em conjunto que, 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 que diga algo que, que nos represente, um, o, o que, que, que provoque um diálogo com o público. Um, e é interessante porque isso pode abrir horizontes que uma pessoa só, uh, ou trabalhando sozinho, não, 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 não teria. Estás a querer dizer que a própria colaboração Uh, entre neste tipo de práticas também é bastante complexa, não é? Exige, requer outro Sim. tipo de disponibilidade, claro. Exatamente, exatamente. Uh, e isso nota-se muito na ópera, não é? E, 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 em vários tipos de instalação sonora. Uhum. Uh, um, e é porque é preciso ter competência nessas áreas, que eu não tenho. Eu sou um mero compositor e pronto, se eu quiser aventurar-me noutra área, tenho de ter de, 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 de colaboração. Ivan, mais uma pergunta, eu estou a pensar, muitas vezes elementos de música espiritual uh, parecem no música popular, 
na música popular, no, no rock music. No, no... Uhum. Duas vezes tinhas uh, interesses para explorar estas coisas mais e como se usam os símbolos do... espirituais na, na cultura popular, por exemplo? Um... Uh, sim, mas, mas é preciso é outra vez uma questão de tempo um, a música rock por exemplo, eu, eu não, con não conheço o suficiente para, para me aventurar nesse tipo de, <risos> de investigação mas a música popular quer dizer, há, há repertórios inteiros de, de música um, folk music, não é? De, 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 devocional que incorpora elementos da espiritualidade isso acontece em todos os países isso é muito interessante eu tenho lido bastante sobre isso e, e um bom exemplo, por exemplo são, são os vilancicos, os, os carols ah, desculpa, esta é a minha filha a ligar para mim ah, ah, que são coisas de tradição popular, mas que incorporam uh, teologia. Uh, uh, e são expressões populares de, de, de conceitos muito complexos teológicos. Uh, isso acontece em todos os países. Isso é muito interessante, esse, esse, esse cruzamento. Um, em Portugal há todo aquele repertório de, uh, de, 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 de canções de devoção um, uh, colecionados pelo, pelo Lopes Graça, por exemplo, um, uh, cantadas em procissões populares uh, nas aldeias, não é? E a mesma coisa acontece em todos os outros países. Um, e às vezes essas tradições já, já não são recuperáveis, já, já, já se foram para sempre. Uh, o Ivan, uh, would you like to say something more? Because you, you were I... interrupted by the point. <laughs> I, I think I've spoken enough. Um, okay. But I, I, I hope to have um, explained something of, of what, I, what I've been interested in and what I've been... One of the other things I should say, actually, is that um, uh, I've hardly published anything in Portugal because there is nowhere to publish. I can't publish in the Revista uh, de Musicologia Portuguesa because I'm one of the co-editors. Um, uh, and many of the things about which I've written... They have a more natural destination in journals such as Musicologia in, in Belgrade or other Balkan journals or some, sometimes in America. Um, so um, this is, I think, another reason why people may not be very aware of, of, uh, of my research interests. Okay, so we hope that changes <laughs> a little bit in the future. Um, so I thank you very much for all your interests and all your adventures and all the ways how you illuminate also uh, all different cultures and the cultures and the culture from where I come from also. Um, now uh, I need just to announce the, the next session. The 3 de fevereiro será apresentado o projeto exploratório do grupo de estudos de música antiga, Mark Moose para a criação de um centro de estudos de papel de música e caligrafia em Portugal. Uh, e vai ser apresentado para investigador principal, António Jorge Marques, e outros colaboradores e investigadores da equipa, com modera moderação de Zuelma Chaves. Uh, na mesma hora e no, no mesmo link do Zoom, no dia 3 de fevereiro. Outra vez, muito obrigada, Ivan. Uh, Obrigado, eu. Foi um prazer. Muito obrigada, Rita, pela organização e outros colegas pelo acompanhamento, comentários 